Hello, a very good evening to everybody that has joined us here today for our technical session. Okay, very quickly, I will introduce the personality who would um, give an opening remarks as well as introduce our speaker for today. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, the person who will give our opening remarks today is no other person than our alternate YP chair and the person of Victor Anoche. So, please, um, Victor, the floor is open for you to give us opening remarks as well as help us know who our speaker is. Thank you, Victor. Yeah, thank you, Akban. So, um, first, uh, let me apologize for for starting this meeting late. So, we are very sorry for starting late. So, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's technical session organized by the SPE Abuja session. So, on behalf of our, of our session chair and um, our programs chair and every other board member present, um, we say welcome. So. Um, before I introduce the speaker, uh, we uh, want us to ensure that we are we are sitting in a good position, uh, free of hazard, okay, so that we can enjoy this session. So today's um, technical session is going to be very very interesting. We have an interesting topic, and the topic is uh, the value of time lapse seismic in a deep water field. And uh, we all know that uh, currently the price of oil is low, and this has presented us um, an opportunity to take stock of our expenditure in deep water drilling and to identify areas of waste and reduce value obtained from oil production. So there's a tendency for every amount spent on project and to place a hold on further expenditure and investment in these assets. So one of the first effects of of this is um, cutting costs on data acquisition, especially for, for the seismic. So the, um, today's presentation will be centered on um, for the seismic information and feed development decision. And our presenter today is Ogogo Efiong. Ogogo is the SP, session direct, SP legal session director. She's a mentor to many young professionals um, including me, and uh, I consider her a pillar in SP Nigerian Council because of her selfless service to see that everyone, both young and experienced professionals, actually get value from SP and also from their professional um, field. So Gogo is a senior production geologist with over 20 years of technical experience in Austrian oil and gas business with assignment in Nigeria and the United States covering offshore drilling operations, reservoir estimation, field development, and execution. She's a 4D seismic interpretation subject matter expert and the front end development project manager. She's currently working with shell companies in Nigeria, leading projects in both deep water and shallow offshore. She is happily married to Joseph, and they are blessed with two teenage sons. So join me as I welcome Ogogo Efiong for this presentation. Thank you very much for that introduction, Victor. It's very, very good to hear your voice again after such a long time. And I would like to use the opportunity to also welcome those of us who have been able to join the session today. I know how difficult it is to carve out time to, um, to discuss uh, technical issues, but it's very important that we we do that both for ourselves and for our careers. Um, I think the good thing about um, the virtual situation that we are in now is we have the opportunity to learn as much as we can. Um, everybody's going online now. The other day, I just received a, a letter, an email uh, for one of the banks, old generation bank for that matter, inviting me to a Zoom call uh, to talk about money management. And I laughed to myself. I said, this is a bank that was even struggling with uh, uh, moving online and uh, of uh, apps and cool not too long ago now they are also doing uh, online session training sessions for their for their members so it presents a very good opportunity for us to be able to learn as much as we can and uh, i hope that uh, through this interaction we should also go technically as well 
and get to know a little bit about what 4D seismic is all about and how it has helped uh, some fields in Nigeria to, re to, to realize their potential. So if you go on to the slides, please. Okay, so I, I think I can just introduce myself a little bit, even though um, I guess a few of us online have, have worked with or interacted with me in the past. I am a graduate of University of Benin. I graduated from uh, the geology department many years ago, certified uh, geologist as well. Um, I've had the opportunity to work in deep water Nigeria for a big, big IOC companies. And I've also had the opportunity of working in a smaller company uh, also, also in Nigeria. Um, luckily, as well, because of uh, all the work that I've, I've been very active in the SPE uh, Nigerian Council and also in the Lagos section, and of course, my sister um, association is the Abuja section as well, which all of you are part of. Um, and uh, I'm sure maybe in, in, as we go along, we should be able to maybe have more interactions on the SP side of things. SP is, is, is an association that I'm very passionate about. And that is because of their drive towards a technical dissemination, in education, and helping as many people uh, in the oil industry as possible, which all of you know we all need that support. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Okay, I think we've talked about safety already, but just to remind us that please, I hope you're not taking this call while you're driving. Um, and I hope that even though you're, you might be using a headset, that you can also hear your background. So if something is going on behind you or around you, please make, your, make sure you have your headset in a way that you can also hear what can be happening around you. Um, in case of any kind of emergency. And of course, uh, let's try to be on mute when we're not speaking. And when you do want to speak, you can maybe put a chat box, put a chat in the box, or you can just come off mute at, um, you, at the intervals and ask your question. And we're happy to take your questions and comments after this. Thank you, next slide, please. Okay, I hope I'm audible as well. You can hear me clearly. Yes, we can. So, all right, thank you. So we're going to be talking about 4D seismic. And I'm, I don't know how many of us are really involved in seismic interpretation or have geology, um, a geology, geophysics background, or even in some cases, reservoir engineering. The most interesting thing about 4D seismic is that you, when you say seismic, you typically think about geophysics. But when you talk about 4D seismic, it is the only area, one of the only areas that is truly, truly, truly um, integrative. It really requires uh, integration between this geologist, the geophysicist, the reservoir engineer, uh, production, uh, all coming together to be able to make sense of what the data is telling us. So I'll give you a few, in, a, a few introduction on standards. I'll talk about the geological overview of the field and why it lends itself to 4D seismic, because not every field lends itself to 4D seismic. And I'll show you some business results of how um, the actual data was used and how it has been able to um, realize the benefits for the field. And then we'll summarize, and of course, I'll take your questions after, after, this, after the presentation. So just note your questions down, and then we can discuss them. I'll put them in the chat box, and then we can discuss them after the session. Next slide, please. Okay, so it's just interesting to note at this point that not all fields lend themselves well to 4D seismic for the interpretation. Um, and that is because you are trying, what your, the whole concept of 4D seismic is a time lapse seismic. It is a seismic that you acquire within some years apart. And the essential things that it tracks changes in the subsurface. So what is seismic? Seismic, I'm assuming that because we are, many of us here might be in the oil industry already, so you already have an idea of what seismic is. I'm not going to go into details about acquisition, processing, and so on and so forth, time to depth conversion, and so on and so forth. I will just say here that um, typically what is done is on, uh, on the acoustic impedance of, of the data, right? Um, for the seismic is interpreted in hardening and softening, which is the hardening usually occurs when there's an acoustic um, increase of the reservoir. So essentially what it is, is you, you take a difference between your monitor data and your base seismic. So which is that you acquire data before production, that's your baseline. And then you, when you begin to produce your field, 
especially in fields that have um, water injection and in some cases the use of gas injection. But then you, when you begin production with water injection, especially or any other kind of enhanced um, method, you then acquire another 3D seismic and then you do a difference between the two. Now the whole point about that is that when you're injecting, especially when you're injecting water or gas or any other fluid into it, when you're changing the acoustic properties of a reservoir, the seismic character begins to change. In some cases, there's a reduction um, in, the, in the acoustic um, impedance of the reservoir. In some cases, there's an increase in acoustic impedance of the reservoir. Now, that change between the base and the monitor, and you can do as many as, you, as, as, as money allows you, I guess, that change between the base and the monitor is what is called the 4D, is what is called the time-lapse seismic. And that information, the difference between the two of them is called the 4D difference. And that gives us a lot of information um, as we mature our fields. So if you go on to the next slide, please. I'll just show some, some uh, maps. So the field, the, the field that I'm going to be talking about is in deep water Nigeria. It's about 200 kilometers offshore. And the reservoirs are, of, of course, they are subsea. They are below this, they are below the ground level, below the seabed, uh, several thousand kilometer feet uh, in, below the seabed. And you can see the areas there that on the right um, panel there that shows us the depth scale of where the reservoirs are actually located. Now, looking at the map on the upper left, the green area there, that's the delta uh, part of Nigeria. Those blue and red dots there are offshore fields, of course, by, all, by no means, not all of them, but some of the offshore fields that we have. And the, the field in question is, the, is marked in yellow there. And essentially what the, uh, the, the uh, geological model below is trying to tell us here is that we are looking at deep water turbidite fields. We're looking at fields that ha have been deposited below the surface of the water. Now, these fields typically are quite prolific um, they have a lot of sand, sand they're they mainly sand and shale intercalations. They're quite prolific. And there are some companies that are currently producing from the deep offshore. So if you go to the next slide, please. I just want to also uh, mention here that this particular reservoir is also because of their depth. Um, the pressure maintenance um, is not by natural aquifer. You always need to inject water into the reservoir in order to pro uh, provide enough pressure to produce the wells in the, in, at the high risk that they are is being produced. Now, that is, of course, the reason why uh, for this seismic feasibility is always done, because you need to be able to be sure that for the seismic is feasible before you start um, expending a lot of uh, money to acquire the data. Now, on the left-hand column there is the is a 3D seismic uh, map, the left -hand most one with the bright colors there. Those warm colors you are seeing are the outline of the reservoir where um, you have good sands that are hydrocarbon bearing. And then the, the panel below it there is the 3D seismic, pre-production seismic. Now essentially in the two maps in the middle there where you have first monitor 4D and second monitor 4D, essentially what had happened was in the pre-production seismic was shot maybe in, in, in the year 2000, and so before production took place. And then between 2005 to 2008, they had started, the, the, in 2000 and 2005, up to 2008, water injection had also begun in the field. So in the middle panel, the way you see those blue blotches, those are areas where um, water has replaced oil, which shows that the injection efficiency was quite high. The, the injected water was pushing oil into the optic producers. Now you can see some black lines there. I don't know if you can see them very clearly, but you can see some black lines there. And those black lines are uh, the fault, the fault in the field, while the white um, dashed lines you're also seeing there are late stage um, uh, shale, bearing, uh, shale bearing channels that are also seen as uh, things that create um, barriers to, to, to production. Now, what we are seeing here is that there is a, an increase, there's a change in the produced oil water contacts around the field. Now, the water injection, injector wells are not injected into the aquifer. They are injecting in the oil lake. So many at times you find that where there used to be oil previously, there's now water. And then the optic producers have produced from the crest of the field. 
you go on to the next slide, please. Right, so this is an example of what well optimization can bring. Now, I, of course, the cost of 4D seismic, which is again, just repeat seismic, is not, uh, it's not, it's not cheap. And many a time companies, especially at times like this, companies make a trade off about um, the cost of acquiring 4D seismic versus what the benefit is. And that trade off has to be very clear. You need to know how much oil you have left behind and you have to have be, be able to tell if the value of acquiring the data is going to be more than what you what is left behind so in this case i have just two there are two examples here of where this particular field carried out some well optimization acquiring data so they went ahead and acquired the data and the value of information basically takes the value of the project with data and the value of the project without the data so you look at decisions that you are going to make and what they would have given you for the, for the development and from a production perspective. And then you deduct that from what you actually spent. And of course, there are many steps in between, you know, whether the data quality, how much you spend for processing, what the well, um, the, the, the moving the wells have been, the cost of moving the wells versus leaving them where they are, and so on and so forth. Now, what this particular project discovered was because of the data that they were able to acquire, they made certain decisions in the field like they moved one of the wells from the mid-flank location to the up-flank location. And if I those two wells are saying there, so they move them from the mid-flank to the top of the crest of the structure and therefore gain more, more, more height. And then we're able to produce oil that was in the attic and that might have never been produced in the first place. And there's another example there that shows that the, where they were going to, they were going to redrill a well into a location that was already flushed by another well, which would have meant that they would have gotten to a place where they expected to see oil and they would have found flushed water um, from another well. So in, once they got the data, they sidetracked the well to a different location and they were able to sweep a location that was previously not being swept by the original well. Now taking all those considerations into, all those activities and operations into consideration gives a value of information which we are seeing there in the millions of dollars, um, for, at least for this particular field, because they're very prolific, prolific field. So if you go on to the next slide, I have a few more examples of how the data has been used. So in reservoir containment, now again, in this particular field, there's sometimes when you may not have the um, response that you expect um, based, on the, based on the acoustic properties that you know of your reservoir, and of course the well behavior, because every, every time you have to make a decision with your uh, reservoirs, you always have to look at what the production is, is doing. Now in this particular case, the down deep well, I don't know if you can see it really clearly, it's a down deep well in blue. That well was showing like a localized um, pressure increase. And it wasn't clear that the pet producer towards, towards the, in red there towards the north was receiving, um, was receiving support. Now the whole idea is the field uh, injects, puts injected water as well as and produces oil from the producer. So the, all the, the wells have to justify their cost in terms of well pairs. Now in this particular scenario, the producer was not actually in communication with the injector. I mean, it was, uh, although the injector was producing, was injecting as much oil, uh, water, sorry, as it could, but the producer was not feeling the impact of that water injection. So the 4D seismic again was used to determine that the injector was just injecting in a very localized uh, pressure cell and that pressure cell was not was being prevented from to the producer. So it's almost like you're trying to push water in a direction and there's something that's preventing maybe a localized change of a lithology or some other feature that maybe sometimes you may not have been able to see by a conventional 3D seismic. But in doing a 4D seismic, you're able to see that the, the flood front is not getting to the um, desired um, um, producer. In this case, the pressure front was not getting to the design producer and the producer continued to struggle. So I guess this gave us another information in addition to production, of course, and then the well, um, the, several acti activities were then um, carried out on the wells um, to be able to, to determine what, what um, how to make them to produce. But the bottom line here about reservoir containment is when you're injecting water into reservoirs, you don't know, sometimes you, I mean, you're not able to tell how effective that can be. And you also don't have a control on how far 
the water gets injected. So I've seen situations in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, where um, injected water was was channeled through a fault, and the team didn't know this until they took the fault, decided it was channeled through a fault, through a fault plane into a different reservoir, mm -hmm. and it increased the pressure of that reservoir inordinately. And when they tried to drill into the upper reservoir, they took a pressure kick. Mm -hmm. So things like this, for example, for the seismic is helps also helps to show you where you have localized pressure cells. And again, just to mention that it's a snapshot in time. So it's not something you can use um, you know, over and over. You can use it for a, for a bit, but always recognize that it's with respect to a particular time frame. So that's why your production information is very critical in this case. If you go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so by the same vein, the project also, the field also used um, this for shadow hazard monitoring. Now the upper left corner there shows you a, the seabed map of the field. And if you look, if you can zoom in, if you can look really closely to it, there are some places that you can see they are called pop marks. Now those pop marks are, they can be extrusions of gas or even, you know, water or even, um, they also extrude sand, right? But they are extrusions of gas that come out from the subsurface. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they, they create a, a, an area of instability around where they operate. So, of course, you also want to go, some of those pot marks are also uh, conduits from deeper within the reservoirs, and they conduct gas and other fluids from the deep within the reservoirs to the surface. Now, of course, you want to know if some of those pop marks, and they're naturally um, occurring features, by the way, and they, I mean, they've been there since, I guess, the earth was created. But you want to be able to tell if they are moving, if they are increasing, if they become active or, or reactive, as the case may be. And of course, you want to track that from the surface down to the subsurface to see if they are now beginning to cross your well balls or, try, or, or threaten some of your structures, your subsurface structures, both your, sub, your subsea and your subsurface structures as well. So for the seismic also helps because what it does is you are shooting seismic over um, the, the life of the field and then you can see where production effects might be taking place. Now, not in this particular field, there's a field in, um, there was a field in the UK that in the, I think it's called the Ecofisk. Indeed, the, there was a subsidence that was taking place um, that was really so bad because they were removing oil, uh, oil from the so from subsurface. And of course, they began to feel, um, begin to feel that there was some kind of subsidence. And it was a 40 that gave the information on the, on the change between where they were previously and where they were currently. So it can be quite useful for that perspective uh, to, to be able to determine what's going on in, 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 even in the shallow section. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now this is another example of where the data was used, and this is when it was used for infill opportunities. Not only does it tell you where you have sweep, like the map on the right, for example, those blue areas outlined in the blue there, they, I didn't put the wells on, on, on that particular map, but what had I done that, you would have seen that those areas are the areas that surround the water injection injectors. Now, obviously, if I'm going to drill new wells into a field of this, of this kind, I would not be putting it in any of the areas I have shown that have been swept by water already. I'll be looking for areas that are still showing as being unswept. Um, and those are the areas that have some kind of infill opportunities or, or left behind opportunities. And that's what really gives you the value of the information because you're able to make these decisions based on data. Of course, you have your production data, but the production data, as you know, is always localized around the well board. But this gives you uh, a more lateral um, data set. Albeit, yes, it has its own limitations, but at least you're able to get natural um, field-wide information that tells you of the movement of fluids in the subsurface. Okay. So this is the last, the second to the last slide. I think um, if you go on, please, to the next one. I'm going to spend one or two minutes there to talk about um, the reservoir model updates for the closed loop and assisted history matching and how you can use how the two of them come together. Okay, so I will start off with the, what you see there called the pre-production static model. And essentially you've, what is done there is taking the pre-production seismic interpretation. So you've done your depth conversion, you've acquired a 3D data, you've done your seismic interpretation, you've done your depth modeling, 
you have um, um, you've created your property models. Maybe you have one or two wells. You've tied them to the well bore. You have a few more wells. You've tied them to the, the wells to your models, and then you've used you've created a three D geocellular model, right? Um, typically, you have your 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 rock synthetics. You've got your wavelets are also there, and you've also got your horizons now. What then happens is you can then go a step further by extracting. So that's what we call the 3D closed loop, right? So within this whole assisted history matching for the closed loop, there are other small iterative loops. Now, the first one is the 3D closed loop, where you first create a 3D geocellular model, and then you extract the synthetic seismic from it, and then you compare that with the, with the model. So essentially, what you're trying to do is saying, after you've taken in the your seismic interpretation and then you've created a 3D static model from it, you want to then extract a seismic from it and compare that to the original input. So it's like an, a 3D loop kind of. Um, so that is a very iterative process. And once you can get a good match between the two of them, the next thing is to then create a an inversion for of your net to gross model. Now there are different algorithms to create a net to gross model from 3D seismic um, and that's the discussion for another day for by our geophysicist colleagues. But essentially what then happens is you, from the 3D static models, you're able to create a net to gross model and a net sand model. Having done that, you match that again with your static, make sure that both what you expect from the static model and what you're getting from the, from the inversion model, from the net to gross model are also as similar as possible. There should be a match between the two of them. They should be, they shouldn't be chopped and cheese. And then once you've gotten a good match there, the next thing is to then merge that with your, again, 4D wavelet and your 4D seismic. In doing that, you are creating a 4D inversion. What that does is it then converts your net feet of hydrocarbons to net feet of saturate, water saturation. So at the point at which you are communicating with your reservoir engineer, you can then have a model that says that this is what you expect um, the, the number of amount of feet of swept hydrocarbons um, that you have remaining in the reservoir is consistent with what the wells are saying. So you always have to have that handshake between the two where both your production data and your saturation change, delta saturation change, change, saturation change, your change in saturation model, your production data and your well data are all singing the same tunes. Um, and it's really, really iterative. Sometimes it gets better towards the well ball but as you go away from the world, but the, the data seems to fall apart a little bit. So it's a very iterative process. And this is what I meant. I said that, you know, for the seismic um, is where you have production data, you have reservoir engineering, you have um, geophysics and you have geology, all of them coming together to be able to really, really decipher what the, what the data is telling. Now, obviously, once you're able to then come up with a model that is very representative, both from, um, if you're lucky enough to have some new wells that are drilled that have confirmed the net feet of hydrocarbons remaining, then you are able to then have something that you can use to constrain your dynamic model. Now, typically what happens is you can that use that, that's your assisted history match because it's matched to the history of the reservoir and the, the nearer you are to the, you are able to match um, the data with your history then you can now use the predict. Now, now, of course, once in a while, you still do get surprises down the road, but for all intents and purposes, this is an iterative process that helps to really close the gap between your expectation and what you have um, and your model. So it reduces your uncertainties and improves your ability to predict your reservoir behavior, which is really, really important. By the time you're spending um, millions to, to drill wells, and to acquire data, you want your uncertainty range to be as minimized as possible. It's not just uncertainty, there's also uncertainty, there's also your risk. You also want to minimize your risk. There are, like I mentioned, I showed some examples of um, where you have geohazards and you want to be able to test that those geohazards have not been reactivated inadvertently or they have not been out of zone injection. You want to be able to understand just how much your reservoir is changing over time um, based on the activities, your, your field and um, reservoir and field development activities. So for this, I have to say way, uh, time lapse is a way to be able to give you that information. Um, so this process is, is very time consuming. What I find though is that like all the maps that I showed, for example, they are very 
easy and quick to do maps. Uh, and you can do them from the 4D defense data or you can do them on, on the map level, depending on your level of skill. And of course, you also have to be able to, um, to um, remove from, from your geological understanding what is the noise and what is signal and really, really focus in on what is what the data is telling us in terms of um, what I'm replacing or in terms of hardening up the reservoir. So from that perspective, I find out that the majority of the information that is given by the data can be done um, really from just doing those quick, quick difference maps, the 4D difference maps, those ones I've been showing you before now. And this extra step of really using it to do modeling requires quite a quick deal of iteration and, and um, modeling. Uh, so it really depends on, for, to, to go this entire route, for example, the term, it depends on what the objectives of the field management plan is. So I think I'll leave it there and I'll just summarize. You go on to the next slide, please. So what are the value drivers for, so value drivers are, what, what does it do? How has it been able to enhance our understanding? Now, from a value of information perspective, which is where the acquisition of data meets the economics of it all, which is value of information. So the value of information, at least for this particular field, we've been able to see that the investment um, has more than paid for itself and there have been uh, better field development decisions being as a result of the data. Uh, this, the data has also been able to help this uh, field to benefit from better uh, producible volumes. Now, there are some trapped volumes, some bypass volumes, some attic volumes that the field would not have been able to see, to see, but we're able to now see them and then to access them from using the data. Now, I also want to just put a caveat here that this is very, this is specific to this field. Not all fields are, um, are amenable to this kind of data. So of course, I'll just list some of the characteristics that will make your, your field to benefit from for the seismic. Number one is it should have a good baseline seismic. Um, and you are going to be if you are producing it in such a way that you are creating a change in uh, your acoustic properties. Take for example, you're injecting water, you're injecting gas, or you've produced for many, many years and expecting that maybe there might be some compaction. So what 4D does is that it tracks changes in your subsurface. So your, your reservoir uh, type must be amenable to show those changes when, um, when you take your seismic data. So, Fields that are uh, amplitude supported, for example, would be able to benefit from from for the data. So, it's, so you would be able to look at um, it from that perspective. Not all fields are as blessed as we are in Nigeria, but some of them definitely have um, some sort of challenges. Another point there is about the model revalidation. Now, we all build models because we want to be able to calibrate how much hydro hydrocarbons we have in our in our field. But then as production goes on, we're able to use this data to kind of get better forecasting, you know, reduce your drilling uncertainties and provide confidence in your field and reservoir management strategy. Because by the time the data comes out and confirms what your models have told you, then you know that your practices have been fit for purpose and you can continue with them at least in the near future. Now, there's another thing that's, um, that comes about, which is fluid contacts. Now, in this particular field, there were some, some estimated fluid contacts. The fluid contacts were never really penetrated by wells. And you don't have the luxury of drilling wells in really nearly to, to penetrate the oil water contacts. But from the data, once the production started and injection also started, there were signs of movement around the water contact. So you know, I mentioned to you that there was the produced oil water contract and there was the original oil water contact. And those two contacts became very visible once before the data was, was, um, was interpreted. So what that does, and what that did for this particular field was to then give you know, a, an area of interest that tells you where your um, reserves were sitting. So that was a very important step for them as well. Um, so this was a big success. I think the field has gone on since, the, since this presentation was done. The field went ahead and acquired another uh, vintage of data. So at some point in the future, maybe you'll be hearing 
a little bit about what that, uh, that has been able to reveal. But I think suffice to say, I'll just round up by saying that it's one of those things where you really have to quantify for yourself and for your field, for your development, what it is that you want to achieve um, and if this kind of data is going to be amenable. So there's the feasibility that needs to be done to determine if your field is going to be amenable to, to time lapse seismic. Um, because you have to be able to show, the, the subsurface has to be able to show those changes as they, as they happen. And of course, part of the whole strategy is also determining how many of these data sets you're going to acquire throughout the field life. It's not something, it's not cheap, so it's not something you can acquire every year, or you can determine, instead of acquiring a field-wide, maybe you want to acquire, depending on your size of your, of your reservoir, of course, you want to only acquire in areas that are, um, that are giving you trouble, trouble spots. But what I find, again, is that, that strategy works, it's called the I4D, Intelligent 4D, but what I find about those is it doesn't be limited over small areas. It can be fit for purpose and it can be cheaper. But the truth is the subsurface does not behave like that. There are many times you are producing something somewhere and the effect is being felt somewhere else. And if you don't acquire data across the entire field, then how do you know what is connected to what? So I've seen a bit of that in, in, uh, in my experience as well. Um, so it's um, definitely something that is recommended, uh, especially at this time. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions uh, going forward now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Um, I, I want to say this is very insightful and I want to open um, the room for questions. So please, if you have questions, you can just drop your questions on the chat box. Uh, and also, um, okay, she has already given us the summary, but for those of us that, uh, that uh, joined us late, um, she actually um, talked about the global practices, uh, the global best practices of 4D seismic, and also the geological overview of the, the, the field that was studied. She talked about the seismic acquisition history and how um, 4D seismic can be used for uh, better field development. And uh, one of the benefits is to reduce our sensitivities and to uh, minimize risk like um, geohazard. Though I'm not a geology, I only have little information about geology, but I, I believe I've been able to get um, um, some information from this lecture. And uh, I want to ask, please, uh, let me ask my question first before I go to the chat box. Um, <laughs> Okay, in one of your slides, you, you talked about the cost of acquiring um, 4D um, seismic, uh, seismic data. So I want to ask if, when you compare this uh, cost to previous um, um, seismic data, so what would you say? Do you say this is more expensive because you showed us uh, two different costs there? And also, is there a disadvantage of using 4D? Okay, so I'll answer this. Your, your question, the cost that I gave there was not the cost, it was the value of the information. It was the value that was realized after taking into consideration the cost and then quantifying the benefits that were accrued. So it was saying that on top of the cost, yes, you took a cost, but you got some benefits. And when you do the two, the difference there is the value of the information. And that's what I showed on the screen. So depending on how much money was spent and I, and I don't remember the figures to be very frank with you but the amount of money that was spent <clears throat> the slide that i showed that the project realized i think it is something and a hundred and something million dollars returns so from that perspective you really would say that depending on what was i mean even after taking into consideration the spend and then the time gap and this was i think that was 2000 and um, 12, yeah, so that's VOI, value of information. So that's what I said. So that was, it is, yes, is the overall ultimate recovery gain, is the gain from the ultimate recovery by, by the decisions that we're taking from the data. So you've taken the data already, you look at what you would have done if the cost was, if the cost was, I'm talking about NPV, that's net present value. So it's not just the cost of the data, it contains a lot of other different uh, things. And just to say here that 4D seismic is time-lapse seismic. So what it is is that you take 
two different seismic volumes that were acquired some time apart after production has taken place, production and water injection has taken place. They are acquired within the same acquisition parameter and then the difference is made. That difference is what is called the 4D seismic. So think about it like you take a 3D, you take another 3D, you do a difference, and then that difference cube is what is called 4D seismic. So you ask the question here, I think you asked, you said, um, do who benefits from 4D? You said do- Yeah, Michael disadvantage. Yeah, I was asking okay, disadvantage. about it. Yes. Disadvantage is that it can be expensive. Now, if you don't do a proper feasibility to really scope whether it's going to be right, whether your reservoirs are amenable to, they would show the difference that you're looking for. Then, of course, there's a lot of money to spend and you may not see the, the results, which is not that the 4D is not good. It was that you did not do a product, proper scoping. It's almost like saying um, you build a house on a very beautiful house, for example, you built on a sand with, uh, by the beach where there's water and everything and it's, the house collapses. The house was good, but the fundamentals were bad. So if you don't scope out, if you don't understand the, the, the changes that are taking place within your reservoir, for this not a silver bullet, it would only, it's data, it tells you something and how you use that information is what determines whether you're gonna get a value from your money or not. There comes a time, so typically even in this field, the field has acquired about three, I showed you about two of them, two different vintage of data. The field has, has acquired three different vintage of data, but there comes time where even the project managers are going to ask themselves whether the remaining volumes are worth um, chasing with extra data. So there comes a time when you say, well, you know, I've done all the, I've checked the history, I've produced so, so and so much. Acquiring more data is not going to give you more oil. It may help you find where there's bypass oil, but by the time you do a quantification and determine, well, the bypass oil is so small, that's not going to pay for the data that you want to acquire then it begs the question whether you need to acquire the data or not. So that's the disadvantage that I see from that perspective. It's not something you can just do. You really have to do a lot of um, scoping prior to, to, to that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I, uh, we have another question here. Um, okay. okay, but yeah, two questions. So one of them is, um, can marginal feed benefit from 4D for, for seismic? And then um, how, Excuse me. How can they use it to improve their production? And the, another sh um, question here is, what's the difference between 3D and the 4D seismic? Okay, so I'll start with the simpler one, which is what's the difference between 3D and 4D? Um, 4D seismic is the difference between two 3D seismics. So you take a baseline seismic and then you you produce your, after, after some time and you've produced your field, then you take another 3D seismic and then you do a difference between the two of them. And that's what gives you the 4D. So the result of that time gap is what gives you the 4D. So, but you need two 3D seismics that were acquired um, with exactly the same acquisition parameters to be able to give you a 4D. So that's, so that's the way, in a nutshell, that's what it is. So when you talk about marginal fields, I would say marginal fields, like any other field, how to determine where they need to spend money. If the field is already, if the field is already um, marginal, which means that the volumes are already small, then the question is whether you want to acquire it. In, and there are many ways of acquiring. By the way, this discussion is about 3D seismic time lapse. There are other ways of acquiring the same seismic, which is there's some one called it's called distributed acoustic sensing. It's a fiber optic cable within the well bowl. And then you can just like acquire your VSP. I don't know if there are geophysics amongst us here. But you can put it as a fiber optic cable within your well bowl. And that can also help you to take data over the time. And the differences between in time in snapshots between those is what gives it 4D. Now, so that may be something that it may be an application that may be more amenable to a smaller company, for example, and still gives them the information they're looking for. This is really new information. It's really new technology too. I think it's maybe the last five years or so. So I think it's getting better because the problem that they had initially was the amount of noise that was also acquired, that was also um, um, seen around the world ball and the image, getting the image out and so on. But I think in the last few years or so, that technology has really been improved. So. In terms of marginal fields, it's really a cash flow discussion. I mean, how much are you willing to spend for extra data? This goes for any kind of data. 
well data, core data, for the seismic, seismic data, actual seismic data, and so on and so forth. Some marginal fields can make do with a 2D seismic line. Some really want to have 3D seismic line. It really depends on the complexity of your, of your field. And if the field, of course, is doing stuff like water injection, then it begs the question that definitely you will need something that tracks on a field-wide level where your water is being injected. If your field is not doing water injection or gas injection, then it may not be something that is applicable to you. Again, if you want to also track maybe um, aquifer influx, or if you've had years and years of production on natural aquifer, for the seismic may also help. So it's a very nuanced question you ask. It really depends on the field and what the, what the field and reservoir management plan is. Okay, thank you very much for your response. And then um, I have the final question here. Um, and it says, 4D, okay, is 4D, is 4D technology being used in Nigeria um, seismic space? And does that make 3D now obsolete? No, so yes, 4D seismic is used. This field I'm talking about is offshore Nigeria. And we definitely was not the only one that I've seen. And if you go to, if you even go to um, SPE um, papers, where you go to S read SPE Connect and SPE papers, you will find that there are a number of, I think it's called One, one Petrol, yes. If you go to One Petrol, you will find that there are a number of papers there about for the seismic in the Gulf of Guinea, which is all across the whole of Niger Delta and Nigeria. So there are quite a number of companies and fields that are already acquiring 4D. Now, let's not think about 4D as a replacement for 3D. They, each of them have their own place and position in the, in, in the grand scheme of things. It's not a replacement. To get a 4D, you must acquire a 3D anyway. So it's not like, um, you know, once you, so you have to acquire a 3D and then do a difference to get a 4D. In fact, you have to acquire two 3Ds to be able to get a 4D. That's what it is. It's a difference. It's a 4D difference, a time lapse. So it's not here to replace. It, it has its own place. It tells you something um, about the data. You can acquire seismic in, in one year and acquire another seismic 10 years later. And that is not a 4D, actually, because they're both acquired with different acquisition parameters. It's not a 4D. It's just two different seismic volumes. If you want to acquire a 4D, there are certain steps. And that's why I talked about feasibility. There are certain steps that need to have been in place before the, the, the base and the monitor are actually shot. Um, because you need to be able to do them, to have them exactly alike. So when you do a difference, you know what has changed in your reservoir. And is that change that your phobia is trying to tell you. So it's not a replacement, it's just, you know, a different way of looking at the data, if I can use it, say it that way. So it's not, like, like I mentioned, it's not a silver bullet, it doesn't cure everything. If, for example, you're just doing, um, you're doing gas injection, for example, into an oil field and you're injecting gas, it may be diffic more difficult to see that acoustic change. And that is because the properties of oil and gas are much more similar than gas and water or oil and water. So when you're injecting water, the change in acoustic properties is a lot more dramatic than when it is that you're injecting gas, for example. So there are many things that go into um, the feasibility and the, the applicability of 4D within um, a field. So I'll leave it there okay. for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, please uh, <laughs> permit me to read out this. We have two interesting questions here, so please, I don't know if I can take them. <laughs> um, sure. Okay, the first one here is, uh, the first one says, uh, it says, say we permanently install geophones on the seabed, would that reduce the cost of acquiring 4D over the long term? So I'll take that one. Yeah. And the answer is yes. So, the, in fact, there was a field that I studied um, some time ago that had permanently, permanent reservoir monitoring. So they put the geophones on the field. And that person, whoever is asking that question is a geophysicist. Um, Brilliant question, by the way. So you, what people do is that they put the geophones on the seabed or sometimes it's a permanent reservoir monitoring system, PRM. They put them on the seabed. And whenever you need it, you just you acquire the data. You, the boats, and this is an offshore, both of the fields, funnily, were offshore fields. And the reason they wanted them permanently on the seabed was because that whole cost of mobilizing and demobilizing of um, vessels to come and acquire the data with the geophones and hydrophones and so on, so we take it. Where, where it was um, really expensive. So what they wanted to do was they built it within the, sea, the seabed infrastructure and left them on the seabed. So whenever they want, all they need to do is to pass a vessel across it and acquire the data or acquire the data from the actual cables that we're using to connect 
the, the, the uh, hydrophones. So essentially, that's, it's done. There was a very interesting one that I saw as well um, of permanent reservoir monitor where they put the, 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 the phones on the floor, on the seabed, and then they activate them and then they float them up to the surface. When they finish acquiring data, they float them up to the surface and just gather them with nets. So the, the technology is really changing and it's really evolving and it does reduce costs, but it's still not cheap. I think anything that has to do with offshore um, field development is expensive. And I guess that is where the whole value of information and those trade-offs need to be made. You know, the cost that you're, you're going to incur and the benefit you expect to, uh, to get um, as a result. Okay, thank you very much. So the final question, um, since 4D seismic is not a silver bullet, what other options are available to understand the subsurface and maximize production? Good, very, another very good question. So if you have um, a number of wells, and I hope I can remember as many of them as I can, um, just the next minute. If you've got a number of wells, there are different ways. You can have interference tests, you can you know, put uh, tracers, you can have tracer analysis, um, you know, seismic, I've talked about seismic already and so on. So there are many other ways of getting to understand what's going on in the, in the subsurface. I keep, I, you know, as a geologist, I always joke and say, the day somebody can, you know, put a geologist inside the well, but that day, you know, I think we'll be, we'll, everybody will be very happy whether they can put us into the well, bowl and <laughs> lure us into the ground and help, you know, so we can get the cuttings out ourselves. But everything else, apart from that, is just by inference. It's by inference from wells, it's by inference from seismic, it's by inference from um, sometimes even magnetic data or radiographic data and so on. And so but there are many different ways of trying to understand, but they all give you a piece of the information and they all give you um, data. So how you interpret the data and what you do about it is what determines how effective that mode of um, data acquisition has been. So I'll just leave it there for now. And I would just like to say thank you to everyone who attended and for all your fantastic questions, very thought provoking questions. I hope I answered them and I hope I did justice to the topic as well. Well, thank you very much. Um, personally, I enjoyed the session and I, I've really learned a lot from this. So I want to say thank you for this and then uh, also, um, Okay, I think I will allow, I will, I will call up on our session uh, programs chair to, to give the vote of thanks and to wrap, to wrap it up. Please, Madam Amina, I don't know if you are, if you're there. Hello. Hello. Okay. Yeah. How, how can I go anywhere when <laughs> OG is speaking? <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Ogogo, for this wonderful lecture. My pleasure. I've, Thank you. I've definitely learned a lot, and I'm sure all the people in attendance have also learned a lot. And um, you're, you're truly a 4D expert and we'll still reach out to you when we have questions. I hope we can send you chats and with, with our sure. questions, even after this program. Thank you sure. very I'm much. Very happy. Victor, you earlier, mentioned, you, you earlier mentioned that Ogogo is your mentor. She was my mentor <laughs> before she became your mentor. Ogogo was the Maybe first person I, I met in SPE and I will never forget how she made me feel. Like Maya Angelou says, somebody can, I, I'm, I'm not sure how the quote goes, but I know that what, what it says is that you can never forget how somebody made you feel. And that is something <laughs> I carry all the way. And Ogogo has not disappointed me up to date. Thank you so, oh, so, so, you. so, so, so much. And thank you for the thank very good pleasure. lecture. And we're still going to call you again. You're, you're, you're part of Abuja section now, since you're a director ah. now. So you, you're not too busy for us now. <laughs> Keep Lagos section on one side and come and face Abuja section. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think much they're here. They're listening to you. <laughs> Some yeah. of my people are here. They're listening yeah. to you. I know. I know. That's why I'm saying it is to prepare them to let you off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Othman, for all your support, 
you're always on our program. Thank you very much. Rekia, thank you. Rume, thank you. Sadiq, everybody, thank you for coming. And all the Lagos section people that have complete. We are brothers and sisters. Well, thank you very much. Look forward to another program. And um, we have one, two actually coming up in October. We have our Independence Day program. So I hope that you guys will make time to join us. Thank you very much, Ogogo, again. All Thank right. you. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Have a pleasant yeah, weekend. Yeah, the section chair sends his regrets. He couldn't make it here. He had some um, other office exigencies, but he truly sends his apologies. Thank you very much, everyone, for making our time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.